Blog Talk Radio. Are you ready to take a bite out of the competition? Are you looking for ideas to make your business better? Welcome to the Core Business Show with Tim Jacquet. Sponsored by Apple Capital Group. At the core of every successful business, you'll find people making a difference. And with each episode of The Core Business Show, we talk with those people, examine those ideas, and explore the strategies that make them special. Now, the host of The Core Business Show, Tim Jacquet. Well, welcome to another episode of The Core Business Show. I'm Tim Jacquet, your host. Today, I have the pleasure of having Brandon Frame. He is the Chief Visionary Officer for Black, the BlackManCan.com. Our show topic today is going to be promoting a positive black male image. If you have any questions, give us a call at 347-324-3460, 347-324-3460. Or you can pose a question in the chat room on Blog Talk Radio, and we'll read the question on the air. Well, Brandon, welcome to the program. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Great. I guess to begin with, tell us about yourself, where you're from, and then we'll segue into your, your nonprofit. Whoever. My name is Brandon Frame. I'm uh, 24 years old and I'm from Hartford, Connecticut. I'm a graduate of uh, Morehouse College, and I'm also a, I have the blackmancan.org, as well as I'm a school administrator, and also working on an entrepreneurial venture going into the fashion industry, so that's just a little bit about me. Wow. So at 24 years old, you're already in the administration? Yes. Well, lucky you. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes I'm, I'm uh, fortunate yeah, enough to, you know, just, just to work hard. Hard work pays off. Wow. I guess I, one of the interviews I did, I did a few weeks ago, I forgot the name of my family. Mine just escapes me. But anyways, she, we were talking about the, her book, and we are talking about blacks in America, and she, and I was telling her about black parenting, and then uh, your name came up. She said, you really need to talk to him to talk about the black male image. And that's what we're going to talk about today is to talk about you know, promoting a black, positive black male image. You know, in the, you know, like the 60s, you had MLK, Martin Luther King, and in the 70s, you know, I guess the predominant person was Barry Cardi and Jesse Jackson. Then you mm-hmm. had the trend of changing positive image, really with, with Bill Car- Cosby. Then, mm-hmm. of course, after Bill Cosby, we had this surge of energy. And then we got Colin Powell. He could have been the next president of the United States. Look, made us look extremely good. And then, of course, nobody will believe in this lifetime. We have now a black president and first lady. And, you know, it's kind of amazing. On the Oprah show about a week ago, I think she was doing something with T.D. Jakes. And he said he wouldn't ever think of it in his lifetime. He just wanted to rate, to call up his great great grandfather and tell him what just to tell them, my gosh, you have a president of the United States because they would never believe that. Believe him. But he said he can go he wish he can go back to his ancestors and tell say, Hey, we have a black president after coming from slavery. Mm-hmm. Taking that all into account and uh, you're part of a newer generation, what do you see America is right now? We're not too far from from slavery, so we still have residuals from that. What do you see where we're going today in the future? I really see us. I see us slowly moving towards where everybody kind of sees everybody as equal, or like there's no stereotypes and and whatnot. But it's a, it's a very slow process. Like when you think about Martin Luther King, and you think about the "I Have a Dream" speech, I think that we're gradually moving towards what he wanted, but also for all and for all races, it's really hard to move past what's so ingrained in our culture, which is you know American racial prejudice, and everybody kind of has some type of prejudices and has discriminatory views on on others. So we're slowly moving forward, and that's one reason why I even created the uh, the Black Man Can was that the one of the major ways to counteract negative images is to provide a positive one. Wow. It was kind of amazing. You can't say, you know, if you look at an African-American child and an Anglo or Hispanic child and you put them all in a room, no one knows what the difference. They know there's some slight differences the way they look. But if you pile them all in the room together as toddlers, they're all friends. There is nothing Mm -hmm. that's pointing out to them that they know can even say the difference because they really don't know what they look like, for one. And even Mm -hmm. if they look at themselves, they don't. Take, they take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> yeah, so definitely. they really don't really care. They just want a friend, and they don't care who it is. And 
I remember having a conversation just probably during the holidays with my grandmother, who is 92 years old, and she she was wow, a domestic. Grandmother. Yeah, and she was a d- domestic, and she said, you know what, the funniest things during that time by taking care of a lot of being a maid for a lot of Anglos, it was weird because they will allow you to touch their children and care for their children so compassionately and trust you with a child, but they didn't want you to touch their forks. It is, you know, don't sit in my chair. And But, however, they trusted their children to the maids, and they know they would take care of them. Regardless, yeah. it's not because they didn't want to do it. It's just it was that disconnect. Hey, I would trust you with my child, my precious thing that I have in the world. However, I mean, to bathe, to clean them, to wash them, to care for them, to pretty much raise them. However, I don't want you using the same fork I have, which was, I say, oh, my gosh, that was really, I had to put that on tape or something because it really tell you what the disconnect is. And I'm glad during that time that now a particular generation, a little bit more sensitive that came out of those 50s and 40s, 50s and 60s. And now, you know, what we are today. Coming from where you're, the college that you come from, you went to Mohouse? Yes. Okay. And it's all black school. And, and when you went there and you decided to go to Morehouse and versus the other colleges, and what was your experience? Not necessarily with racism, but with the culture itself. It was an amazing experience. And I think one reason what makes the place so beautiful is it's an it's a HBCU and it's an all-male HBCU. But when you come, you see the diversity of black men. I think a lot of times we, as a society, and there's various factors that contribute to this, but as a society, we see, in particular, black males in a monolithic viewpoint. And when you go to Morehouse, what makes it so special is that it's 2,800 black males. And when you come and you meet all these different guys, you really realize that, wow, everybody's different. You know, and it's not, a lot of people, when they think diversity, they just think skin color. But diversity comes in so many different forms, and Morehouse is one of the most diverse campuses you'll find. So I remember going to school with, you know, senators' daughters and uh, CEO sons, because I Spelman. So and Morehouse and Spelman have a very close relationships. So, but dealing with, you know, all these very you know, black folk, you know, who come from very high social economic status, right? But then also students like myself, who were first generation college students who come from, you know, inner city, inner city America, and we're all there learning and, and moving forward. You know, I've had, you know, I remember meeting some people who, uh, black Republicans, right, and they could successfully articulate <laughs> why that's why they, and it just, just you get it in a viewpoint that you don't even think, like, that black people maybe even vote that way, but I like, I know guys who can articulate why they feel that way. Or when you think about, you know, I, I met black folk from the South who didn't believe in God. You know, and like when you think about the Bible Belt and you think about, you know, in terms of, of black people and, and, and church, that's something you would, you put the two together and they and they go well together. But I met people who didn't believe in God and they could tell you why they didn't believe in God. And so I think putting all that together, it made for a wonderful experience because these are the type of people that I'm sitting in class with. These are the type of people I'm having lunch with. These are the type of people I'm going on trips with. And so we get to dialogue all about that. And so sometimes the the most learning took place outside the classroom um, as opposed to inside the classroom. Wow. Because we, even with our own race, we're really diverse. You have the, the believers and unbelievers. You have the Democrats and Republicans. And a lot of black people were are Republicans, and mm-hmm. they stand behind it. And yeah. But that's the way who they are. It's just like the difference of even religion. You have the Presbyterians and the Episcopalians, you have your Baptist. So mm-hmm. it's the, could be, you know, how they grew up or what they were really exposed to. But at least today, have you seen within this within this image itself? I know when I was in school in the late 80s and the early 90s that the racial color was starting to come down. There was no difference. I think it was starting to cool off regarding the light skin and the dark-skinned guy, or light-skinned girl, dark-skinned guy, I think there was slowly, all of a sudden, start changing the tide in the 90s. Then it didn't matter anymore. But before then, it, the skin color did make a difference on who you date, and your parents will allow you to date. They didn't want you to mix the pool. You know, they want to keep their skin color at the same, you know, the width is in this particular range. With this new generation that you just come out of school not too long ago, are you seeing the same, or are you seeing it at this point on that image? It really doesn't matter anymore. 
you know, and it, it was interesting. I was just in, in St. Louis last week, and my topic was the role of the black male scholar in a post-racial society. And, and we sat and I broke down post-racial society and whatnot, because that's kind of what some of the things are just sharing, and that's kind of the way people are trying to move with, with that we live in like a post-racial America and whatnot. But I think that we don't, just because, like I said, it's really hard for people to really give past something that's so ingrained as a racial prejudice. And also, I, what I feel, too, is that, you know, just in common every day, just walking down the street, people will wave of all colors, will wave and, you know, say hello and, you know, all these wonderful things. But it's usually once something happens that kind of brings a, about that stereotype or what is actually in the back, in your subconscious, that's when race becomes becomes important. Not important, but it, it plays a role in, you know, how people treat somebody or whatnot. And that's when it starts to become, it's, it's not, and just, it's more subtle now than it was as opposed to, you go maybe 40 years ago, it was, it was much more overt. But now it's much more subtle. But I don't see people, I think it's just really hard for people to move past you know, something that's that, that racial prejudice that they just have that has been compounded by images that people have seen over time. Wow. You know, just going to go back to the Tra- Trayvon Martin type case and the hoodie. I mean, on CNN, they were talking about the hoodies and, you know, people have been wearing the hoodies, you know, since the ninth century or even longer than that from monks mm-hmm. or whatever. But they've forever in the day been wearing the hoodies and still in, in this and throughout the world, it's still because it's it's convenient and it's part of some people' white robes, just like monks and priests and so forth. They don't focus on everything else, but it you know it's from athletes, you know, they keep keep them warm when it's cold, and it has a, a purpose. But then you look at what happened, you know, with George Zimmerman. He's Anglo Hispanic, and he you know kind of profiled this kid and. It, it maybe a chip was on his shoulder or something something happened, whatever, that snapped in him. And I know how the Stanford community is. Do you think in that sense that it was a kind of an isolated incident? Or, you know, is hoodies in the America just look so so bad that we shouldn't be wearing it at all? I think we have the right to wear what we want. But, however, what is your opinion when it comes to the... The hoodies itself is. It, I, is I it, think. I, I mean, definitely hoodies. I mean, I, I have. I have a whole collection of of different hoodies from college <laughs> hoodies to just different name brands and, and whatnot. It's definitely my sometimes my choice of clothing for the weekend, especially when I'm just trying to hang out. But I think what it really represents is that everybody. Yes, everybody can wear a hoodie, and you are definitely entitled to wear whatever you would like. But because of images that have been passed along over of, over history, when you place a black male in that hoodie, it now makes him suspicious, or it makes it puts people in a frame of mind where they're now scared of this person because of the color of their skin in the hoodie. So now it's just you're not sure what they may do to you. You think neg- really a uh, lots of negative thoughts start to come into mind of people, like if you take a, a black male, you put him in a hoodie and some jeans and he's walking down the street and let's just say it's maybe 2 o'clock in the morning, the average person, and not even in, of, of, of almost any race, would probably switch the street as opposed to if it was somebody who was not black. And that is just what I think that's what it represents even more is that why is it that person is suspicious because they're a person of color in a hoodie. Wow. I can understand if it was like hot outside. Nobody's gonna wear a hoodie. It's too hot. <laughs> but in the winter time, it's convenient, especially if you're a jogger or whatever. It's more of a sense of convenience because it's easier to jog with something like that than versus to or to walk outside versus wearing a cap because it keeps you pretty warm. But just kind of a hopefully that is not a negative thing. Then hopefully people will just look at it in a different way. <laughs> Dealing with the within this past 25 years from rap and uh, hip-hop moguls like on TV and so forth. I mean, business-wise, they've done extremely well. Do you think there's a jealousy over that? They, whatever they've done, I mean, there's more opportunities today for someone to make a dollar, honestly. I mean, rappers do it legitimately. People buy their music, and it's not really all of us buying it. It's the mass majority is buying their their hip-hop songs. So Mm -hmm. uh, if I go back, when I was in college, if on college campuses, uh, most of 
the kids that had cars, they come from affluent families, and the uh, and they wanted to express themselves, and they they have speakers in the back seat, and they had the money to buy all the rims and so, and so forth. And the music, they were not buying country western stuff or even rock and roll. Rock and roll was dying off then. They were going straight to rap. And if you go down to a lot of the communities, I went to school in Wichita, Kansas, and you go to not D.C. or large cities, but even Omaha, Nebraska, Kansas City. If you go on college campuses, these state universities, you having more of them actually playing the rap and buying the rap music and cruising down campus in their convertible or whatever and uh, playing their music. And the good positive thing about that, I mean, it, the Tupac's done well, the, the, the Notorious B.I.G. did well, and Snoop, that's a good consumer. But have you, do you think it's a jealousy of that? On um, one sense, they are doing so well. Uh, no, no. With these different no. I don't think there's any sort of jealousy at all because the majority of the people who bring some of those artists that you mentioned in still make way more money than the artists, those artists themselves. There's a whole bunch of people that's way above Snoop Dogg and, and a host of other people who are rappers who make a whole bunch of money off him selling records and performing at venues for concerts. So I don't think there's any sort of jealousy on the behalf of anybody in regards to what uh, music artists have been able to do using hip hop music. And also with sports figures. So it's like Chris Rock said, you know, you're rich and then as wealthy. <laughs> so and, well, yeah, and that, and that's exactly that would be exactly my next point because you're right. Most of the or Chris because and Chris, what Chris Rock says is right because a lot of people are definitely rich but you know it means something different when your kids kids will be all set when you have an estate that is constantly building you know while we're doing this show right now there's some people whose estates are just uh, accumulating interest that's beyond anything we can think of wow if we go back a second to your website the black man can what inspire you to do this particular website it really stemmed from some of uh, the young men I was working with. I started a mentoring program in Atlanta, and I was doing some work with them, and I realized that there was a lack of positive self-identity in the young men. And so for me, it was one thing for me to take them to Morehouse and bring young, bring Morehouse men to the school for them to talk to them and do workshops. But the young men spend a lot of time on the Internet, as many as most people do now. So I had to provide some type of media platform in which the young man could go and see themselves, see different positive self identity, see some role models, and just see a whole bunch of uh, positivity that will put them in the right direction. And so that was kind of what motivated me to do that. I really think of uh, M.K. Asante, he's one of my favorite scholars, when he says, once you make an observation, you now have an obligation. And so I made an observation that a media platform like the Black Man Can didn't exist promoting black men in a positive life. So then now I have the obligation to create it because it does not exist. And that's kind of uh, what I used as momentum from to put it all together and bring it to where it is now. Okay. And uh, is it a nonprofit organization or? Right now, it, or it's, it's, it, right now it's simply a media platform. Like I've been able to do lots of speaking, um, you know, in various venues. Like I mentioned, I was just at. St. Louis University last week, and a few weeks before that, I was at Nichols College. So I've definitely been able to use it to get out there, and I've gone to places to do lots of workshops, and I posted summits in Washington, D.C., Hartford, Connecticut, and Boston, Massachusetts. So it's definitely something where a lot of people are urging me to get that LLC or make it a nonprofit, but I'm still unsure that's the route, which route I want to take because I'm not entirely sure exactly what the black man can could ultimately be. So I just kind of keep going and keep coming up with a lot of different things to bring to the site and things to do mm -hmm. outward in the community and then see which route I should take. Okay. So basically when someone has a story or something, they pass it on to you and you put it on your site that's given a positive role to a black person? Yeah, a black male in particular. So you have like the positive black male news section, which is basically stories ripped from uh, um, the major news outlets to your small 
community, small community newspapers, League of Extraordinary Black Men, where I take the opportunity to tell the story of black men who, from just a regular guy who has a wife and some children, and he's building and molding his family to college presidents. So, because I, I don't really have a criteria, because we all have a different story to tell, and that story could be could motivate somebody else to achieve their dreams. It doesn't necessarily have to be the person of a college. It could just be, like I said, a regular guy who goes to work every day, and he can provide just as much inspiration as somebody who's well thought after or well thought of in in, in the world. Okay. It, also on your web website. You have like a book of the week. Tell us about your book of the week. How do you choose your book of the week? And do they just come to you and submit it and you take a look at it and review it? And how does that work? Yeah, the book of the week really, it might be a book that I'm a frequent visitor at Barnes and Nobles. So sometimes I just see a book and I say, you know what, that looks like a good book that I think, you know, I'll, read the, I'll just read the book jacket. And I'll say, you know what, I think this is a book that I need to promote. Or sometimes authors are definitely always submitting information to me, and I might promote their book um, after reading about it, maybe doing some uh, Google searching and see what other people are saying about it. So it varies uh, a variety of different ways, but I think it's very important to, for people to, to read, and that's why I do that. When you look at, I was reading an article a while back, and it talks about how the average CEO reads seven books a year, and that's the average. That's not that's not the max or the min. So I just said, definitely as people, uh, as society needs to be reading it and just have that hunger for learning and that thirst for knowledge. Wow. And I know you do a lot of speaking and workshops throughout the country. Can you tell us about some of the, uh, the speaking engagements you have taken and topics you you spoke about? Oh, uh, definitely. Uh, it, it, first, it's just been kind of cool to be kind of, to, to build, to be able to do that. Because that wasn't, when I started the Black Man King, like I said, it was just for my students and it's definitely grown over time, but I was recently at Cambridge University and it's with Daryl Frierson. We combined to do a workshop being a uh, black male scholar in a post-racial society. A few weeks before that, I was at Nichols College, and that one was on personal branding and how to promote yourself and build your build who you are and promote it to the world using yourself as well as like social media. Before I was at uh, Boston College High School for a Morehouse Young Men's Conference, the Five Wells Conference, and they are talking about leadership and, and how to develop different types of leadership styles and which in helping students try to figure out maybe right now as high school students what leadership style best fit them. So those are some of the most recent engagements that I've had. Okay. And you're the Chief Visionary Officer. Are you doing everything by yourself on this side or are you having some help with it? Yes, everything that you see, all the posts, all the everything is done just by me. It's just a, it's a one man show right now. I have, I've had help in the past from a variety of people who just looked over stuff in terms of editing a few things every now and then. When I, I'm like, I'll ask, you know, I'm really not sure about how this looks, or maybe a few questions. Do you think of a way I could possibly reword these? But other than that, it is definitely me all the way. So, what can you think? What we should do as African American males to to put ourselves in a positive positive image, I guess in our communities, in our business roles, as within our families and uh, here in America. Oh man, that's such a that's such a huge question. We that could be the topic for the show, but um, there's a variety of different things. First, I think one key thing is for people to build a, a spiritual foundation. Um, that's one. I think, secondly, we have to start to somewhat provide the positive contradiction to the prevailing black male image of today. And so what that means, economic empowerment, political empowerment. We need to get out and vote. We need to own property. We need to, what I call each one, teach 100. So we need to make sure we give back to the community. And if you are doing something positive or you're moving forward. You have to lift as you climb. So as you reach, as you climb the corporate ladder or whatever you want to do, you got to make sure that you reach back and bring somebody else along. So those are just several things that we need to do in order to promote a positive black belt image and to not just ourselves but to society as well. Okay. 
What will you say to the single mother? Bishop Jakes talked about one particular thing in his interview about a week ago, and he said one thing I, we got to always kind of remember. Besides, we're not too far from many, many, from slavery, meaning that ideas can't. It would take generations for this to change out. Maybe we get to the next century, then things probably more of a level field, and it could be more of a distant history. We're only, like he said, he's only maybe like two generations away from that. His grandparents, great grandparents, has been slaves, and he met them. But taking that to that mother who don't know what to do with their son. He said one thing about, he say, what's a father? I don't know. <laughs> what uh, in society for that single mother who don't know how to raise a son or, okay, what's a dad? I don't know. I've never seen that. It's, not, it's a funny thing, but it's not really funny because you haven't really seen these things. You've seen it in the distance, but you really haven't had no training for it. It's like the mother, at least with motherhood, we have a baby. Some things you can do instinctively that you can care for that child. But on the male end, since you didn't see that growing up, you have no really connection to it. You really don't know what to do. And mm -hmm. there's no, you really as a guy can go up there and say, hey, what am I supposed to do? And some of them might in that situation, oh, how can I take care of my son and do things for him? <laughs> what will you say to that mother like that? Should you uh, seek out a mentor? Yeah, so as a young man who grew up with without his father, I, I didn't with my dad till I was 18 years old. So pretty much, and being 24, so I was without him more than I have known him. Um, and that's the first key is to seek out programs, uh, put your son into a space where he will be able to interact with men who will be positive role models for him. Because like you were saying is that um, there are things that a woman cannot teach her or a mother cannot teach her son in regards to how to be a man. And like you can do your best at it, but until it comes from a, a male or that talk or the actual visual representation is not presented to them, it's, it, it's really hard for them to actually try to, to do it. Because they don't know, and if they don't have it modeled for them, it, it pretty much will lead you down the wrong direction. Or um, there will be life will teach them what it, it means to be a man, and that's not always a positive one that life reinforces in a young man. So it's really important for that mother to seek out opportunities with a rights of passage program, or whether it's through a fraternity or a sorority. I mean, not sorority, but fraternity. I think some sororities also have. Um, programs that are for young men. So it's, it's, like it's, it's really important that you get your son into one of those particular programs because that will help model what it means to be a man for him. Okay, the Boys and Girls Club and things like that. Is it, should you restrict your your son or, uh, to look at certain programs? Hey, you need to ease off on some of this hip-hop music. Or Hey, you need to be reading a book at least once a month. <laughs> Outside of your schoolwork, what will you also say to them that can, while you go through this process of trying to find somebody, or if you can, what can you do that that you can kind of guide them in the meantime, like a self help book or something they can be pointed to while they go yeah, through definitely, this process? Definitely books. Looking for a mentor. Yeah, book, books are huge. I'm always on my students about constantly reading books that are not part of the school curriculum. Those are uh, very important, and that's, I mean, the, the major focus that I have with a lot of mothers is more, at what I had just mentioned about, you have to find those programs, because there's lots of programs out there, so you have to put your son in those programs. We can, you can say, let's talk about hip-hop music, in particular, like one of the workshops that I do is it's called Lyrical Lessons, so it's not necessarily about not listening to hip-hop music or lighting up on it, but it's more about actually actively engaging the young men in what they're listening to. So they're listening to it, and some are listening to it and some are hearing it, but they're not necessarily actively or critically thinking about what they're listening to. So I think it's very important for you to engage that young man in what he's listening to, ask him what he thinks about what that particular artist is saying. Sometimes you have to let 
young men hear the lyrics without the beat. So then it becomes completely different because a lot of the beat is what captures a lot of people. But now people are always thinking about what exactly the artist may be saying. And so it's very important to critically think about what they're saying and then have that conversation because that will help change the perception as well. Wow. Anything else you would like to add what we can do as a society to help support these these young guys coming up to be active, not going to say active participants in society, but to be an active role in trying to just do something and have to build a positive male image? I really think when we mentioned briefly about books, but I didn't really take a deep dive in it, but it's, it's really about the types of books that the, the young men are reading. I think it's really important that young men and women as well start really have to learn their history, learn where they come from, because that's something that in terms of the history of, of black people, in particular African Americans, it's not a history that's often told, well, it's not told at all in curriculum within schools, and so you have to go seek it out elsewhere. So when you learn about where you come from, it definitely will allow you to see exactly where you can go because you start to see that so many things that you take for granted or things that you don't even realize were created by people that look just like you. And when you start to internalize that and see that, it allows you to move in the right direction. Okay, we're going to take a caller real quick from Erico 786. Erico 786, you're on the air. Hello, Erico 786. Okay, you're on the air. Yeah. You have a question for our guest, or are you just listening? Just listening. Okay, thank you for listening. Hold on. I'm sorry, it's just I was listening, oh. and then I just want to call. Okay, no problem. If you have any questions, just tag on in, okay? Okay, you rock. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, well, I guess it's uh, for a quick show that we just scheduled oh, an hour ago. Is there some people listening? And, well, I guess we're doing something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but definitely. Anything else? Yeah, anything you'd like to add about your program? Uh, I know you you teach high school. You're in administration in high school. You have programs that you mentor. Anything you'd like to add in closing? Well, I definitely want to, or what we've done at the Black Man Can dot org is we've partnered with BlackCelebrityGiving dot com to present the inaugural Black Man Can Awards, where we're going to be honoring and celebrating black men in over 10 different categories. And mm-hmm. I think that's one way that we at the Black Men Can and also Black Celebrity Giving are doing our part to promote that positive black male image. And so I definitely want anybody that's listening to be sure to check out the website. So, and if you know a deserving black male who fits in one of the categories, please nominate them because we're taking all nominations right now so that we can start to, in, the, in about 15 days, we're going to see how many come in and then to put it out to voting for all the different categories. So that's one thing that I just wanted to mention is the, the Black Man Can Awards presented by the theblackmancan.org and blackcelebritygiving.com. And we're really excited for where it could go. We've gotten a lot of nominations so far, and they're coming in constantly. So I just wanted to throw that out there because I think it's a, a very cool endeavor that we're embarking upon, and I know that it's going to, you know, I know it's got a lot of legs and where it could go. Great. Well, I really appreciate you coming to the program. And again, what's your website address again is? www.theblackmancan.org. Great. I really appreciate you coming to the show, Brandon. And of course, I'm going to have you on the show again. Uh, uh, we're going to have a panel, probably discussion sometime next month. I hope they can get you back on the program and we can talk about more regarding black images in America. See if we can change Sounds the time. Great. Thank you for having me on the show. Thank I you. truly appreciate it. Great. Thank you. appreciate it. All right. Again, this show can be downloaded on iTunes or Blog Talk Radio or on, you can get it on Blog Talk Radio or you can get it on Blog.Apple Capital Group. Thank you for listening to the program today. Tim J.K., your host. If you do go into iTunes, if you can do us a favor, go ahead and write a comment or rating on the show and to kind of give us some feedback on how you like them. Again, thank you for listening. Everybody have a great day. Thank you for listening to The Core Business Show with Tim Jacquet. For more information about equipment financing and asset-based loans, visit our website, applecapitalgroup.com. That's applecapitalgroup.com. Or call us at 866-611-7457. 
We hope you'll join us for our next episode. And remember, you can always get to the core via iTunes. You'll find all our previous episodes there. And thanks again for listening to The Core Business Show with Tim Jacquet.